All right, welcome to this session. It's 11.45 and we'll get started. I hope that you have been um, well fed during the rest, during the previous sessions I have. I really have enjoyed what I've listened to so far. Um, we'd like to welcome <laughs> Travis. He's wearing many hats um, during this conference and he's just done an absolutely stellar job with making this all happen virtually and, and uh, he deserves an enormous amount of kudos and congratulations for the success of this conference. Um, I'm gonna introduce Dr. Thurston and uh, then, then turn the time over to him. So um, Travis Thurston, Dr. Thurston is, is the Assistant Director of Empowering Teaching Excellence here at Utah State University. Travis directs all instructional development programming and facilitates the ETE 10 Professional Learning Pathways Micro-Credentialing Program. I practiced that a lot, I hope I didn't destroy it. <laughs> Micro-Credentialing Program to support instructors in evidence-based and reflective teaching practice. Travis is also a visiting professor for digital age teaching at Universidad Casa Grande in Ecuador. His research interests center on structuring an architect of engagement for educational development through instructional development, instructional design, and instructional practice. With over a decade of experience as an educator in K-12 and higher education, Travis holds a Master of Educational Technology um, from Boise State University and a grad certificate in online teaching and a PhD in curriculum and instruction from Utah State University. Travis and his wife Jenny have four children whose athletic and academic endeavors contribute to his perspectives on teaching and learning. And I'm, and I'm looking forward to this session of, um, to hear what he has to say about power-ups. If you would like to um, put your questions in the chat box, I'll take, make note of those and then incorporate them into our Q&A. If you'd like to do that that way, please feel free to do that. And we'll turn the time to you, Travis. Perfect. Thank you so much, Shelley. Uh, I, I'm really looking forward to talking about uh, digital power-ups today. I've, I've had the chance over the last couple of years uh, to spend a lot of time uh, thinking about how we can engage our students in meaningful ways in online discussions. And I have found uh, this, this digital power-up strategy to be one that is uh, not only really helpful for providing uh, choice and voice, uh, for our students in the online discussion, uh, but also it's, it's very adaptable. So as we talk about these concepts um, and, and how I'm using them with this strategy, I also really want to encourage you to think about how you could adapt this strategy for your own class and for your own students. Let me make sure my slides are working here. But the first question I always like to start with is, is why? Why would we use online discussions? You know, what, what's the purpose? Why would we even uh, start there in the first place? Uh, for me, the first, the first thing is that it's asynchronous. Uh, we can engage students at different times, uh, especially a lot of the students that I teach are graduate level students, um, many of whom have full-time jobs and are working in their field. And so they don't have a lot of time to spend on school. And so online discussions provide a nice asynchronous way for us to uh, engage with each other uh, across time. So I usually use one discussion per week or so uh, with my students. The next one is that, uh, I really love this one. This actually kind of, this idea uh, was presented to me in a, in a very practical way uh, by my friend and colleague, Dr. Mitchell Culver. And he talks about this idea of students, um, you know, picturing our classroom as a box, right? And uh, as our students enter that box, it should change the box, right? So in other words, as our students enter into our classroom, whether that's a physical classroom or a virtual classroom, their presence should end up changing that experience for all of us. They bring their own experience, their own perspectives, and, and together we wanna to cultivate that learning community. And the third is this idea of, of scaffolding, creating structures and supports for our students. So one of the things that we can do in an online discussion is to provide support and uh, we can model some of the things that we actually want our students to do uh, in those environments. So a lot of these concepts that I'm gonna be 
uh, talking about with digital power-ups, um, for me, are helpful to frame uh, in the community of inquiry framework. Or uh, these, three, these three topics of social presence, teaching presence, and cognitive presence, where we see teaching presence as kind of the, the flow and the structure and the process uh, of our own teaching, you know, the expectations that we set, um, the syllabus that we design on, on those expectations, things like that. Cognitive presence then is that, that space where we're, we're learning and we're engaging. And, and social presence is then the, the space where we engage with each other as a community. And we understand the, the humanness of each other, right? It's kind of that affective domain. You can wrap kind of all of those terms into this one term instructor presence. And for me, that's helpful. So I'll, I'll talk a lot about instructor presence in class today. And um, within that term, we think about both the course design and the course facilitation. So what have we done to intentionally plan to engage our students? And then how are we following through on that? How are we facilitating uh, that, that discourse and that engagement with our students? Uh, another way to look at this, I, I read an article by uh, Shannon Riggs and Katie Linder a few years ago uh, from their idea paper um, back in 2016. And they talk about how we can compare uh, our virtual classroom to some of these physical classrooms and, and some of the challenges that exist because of that. Uh, I really love how they point out in that, in that article how the, the architecture of a classroom inherently speaks to the expectations that students will have for that session. So for example, in a classroom that like, like this, a lecture hall, the students understand they're gonna be coming in, they're sitting down, they're gonna be paying attention to the person at the front of the room. Uh, there may be some dialogue back and forth, but that environment signals to them how the engagement is going to be taking place, how they're gonna be interacting with each other and, and some of those expectations on, on what that looks like. In our virtual classrooms, we don't necessarily have the benefit of having a defined space to signal how interactions are going to take place. And because of that, we have to be really intentional on the way that we structure our expectations and the way that we um, really model for the students the type of interactions that we want them to be having. So as we think about online discussions, um, some of my research uh, from my dissertation focused on, on online discussions specifically. And we know that there are several inadequacies. Uh, a lot of times in online discussions, students don't engage in higher order thinking. So if we think about Bloom's taxonomy, uh, rather than maybe getting to the create or the, uh, some of the, the connecting to, to real world actions, uh, a lot of times in, in online discussions, students stay in those lower levels of uh, like remember and understand and, and basic knowledge and don't really engage in the higher order of thinking or higher order discourse. Another inadequacy of online discussions is that sometimes we don't very well facilitate the co-construction of knowledge. So actually getting students to engage with each other in an ongoing discourse. And then another one, of course, is bearing pertinent posts. So a lot of times, especially in certain learn, learning management systems, different discussion posts kind of get buried in the threads. Um, and maybe some of the best posts, uh, students don't actually see a lot of the best posts. So we're gonna address those inadequacies as we talk about digital power-ups. And I just wanna give a call out to, to um, this idea of Bloom's taxonomy uh, because it has structured for me uh, this strategy in a way to get students to engage in different ways and at different levels. Uh, and while, while sometimes we, have, we, we think that uh, in Bloom's taxonomy that we have to start from the bottom, we have to start with those lower levels to build students up to the higher order levels, uh, we actually know from the literature that sometimes if we engage students early on in one of those higher order levels, it can actually uh, be very beneficial for their learning um, as we, we present a challenge. They, uh, they talk about desirable difficulties. Uh, Josh Eiler points this out quite nicely, thinking about uh, what sometimes is called the Goldilocks zone, something that's difficult enough that it's a challenge, 
but not so difficult that students can't uh, surmount that challenge. So specifically about digital power-ups, uh, we're gonna be using some hashtags. Uh, and, and for me, those hashtags are a helpful frame for, for tagging specific key terms. Uh, so when I say the term digital power-up, I am talking about uh, kind of three elements. Within a digital power-up, we have a hashtag, which is a way to tag a post or tag a section of your post. We're talking about a Bloom's level verb. And then we also have an associated prompt. So there will be those three things associated um, with a digital power-up. So for example, uh, hashtag create is one of the one of the digital power-ups that I use uh, with my students. So we have the hashtag, the Bloom's verb is create, which is one of those higher order levels. And then the associated prompt is that I would say, I would ask my students to develop a novel response based on what you've read using text, video, or other supplies to innovate. Right, fairly straightforward. Um, I want to hit quickly as well on talking about the importance of learning together. Uh, one of the things that I do it, with the digital power-ups is I have the students use two to three. So I'll give them seven options of power-ups and that provides them multiple entry points into the conversation, into the discussion. So from those seven options, I'm going to have them choose two to three of the prompts and uh, in their initial post. And I'm seeing Cree's question, do these discussions take place in Canvas? Yes, they do. I use this in Canvas quite a bit, Cree. Um, and I'll show you a specific example too here in just a second. Uh, besides having them include two to three power-ups in their initial post, I also have them include one to two power-ups uh, in, uh, in their comments to their peers. Because again, remember, we want to encourage that co-construction of knowledge. We want to see the students going back and forth. Uh, and then, uh, of course, we also want to encourage the students to contribute insights. So from their own experiences, from their own perspectives, how can we get them to, to uh, engage in a meaningful way? One of the things I love about uh, Canvas, specifically with the online discussions, is we have this option to uh, that you can set in the discussion to like, allow students to like posts, um, and then also sort by likes. And so when I do that, when I set those in, this, uh, in my discussions, I tell my students to use that like or that thumbs up as a, some sort of a currency, right? I'll, I'll tell them to like the post that they think is the, the most quality post uh, that week. Uh, and then by doing that, it actually sorts um, the most liked post to the top. Um, so students are actually curating the discussion thread and curating that board. And uh, I also, as part of that, encourage the students to, to make a post that they think would be worthy of the likes of their peers, right? And, and I, we see that uh, in, in the evaluation that I did, that bore out that students actually felt uh, part of the community and part of uh, part of that process, they, they felt the responsibility to make a quality post for their peers. Okay, I see some great questions coming through. Uh, is it possible to use it in a class of two to three students? Absolutely. Yep, I, and you, you could adapt it in different ways um, to do that. I'll show you an example here. Another question, will you show us how to set the like feature in Canvas? Yes, absolutely. I can show you how to do that. And Cree's question, can they click on the hashtags? Unfortunately, no, Cree. We can't, in Canvas, they, they can't click on the hashtag to sort. Um, but I do, like, I would encourage them to do like a control F or a, or a command F and search for specific hashtags within the page. But unfortunately, that's not a feature yet in Canvas. <laughs> so real quick wrap up. The gaps that we were talking about um, where students don't engage in higher order thinking, that's addressed in digital power-ups where we have students using two to three power-ups. We want them to get moving into those higher order levels. Another gap of the, the lack of co-construction of knowledge, 
we try to address that with power-ups by having them use a power-up in their response to their peers. So they're not just saying, hey, I agree with that, that's a great idea, but they're actually uh, continuing the conversation forward and continuing in that discourse. And then in the third gap, uh, that pertinent content gets buried, that's addressed with the digital power-up strategy as the students are using that like feature and curating the thread each week. So this is just a screenshot here real quick of, of what it actually looked like, uh, an example of what um, a discussion thread looked like using the power-ups. Um, I'm seeing some more questions pop through. Let's see. Yeah, Kreev, hashtag maybe someday. <laughs> I like that. Uh, Michelle, do you experience, do you experience students only interacting with the posts at the top with the most likes? so that students further down don't, don't get the interaction. In my, in my course, um, and the one that specifically where I did the evaluation, I saw that the students, um, well, there was a mix. I wouldn't say that the students that were at the top had the most um, comments. Uh, it was actually a little more associated with the, the posts that had the fewest comments were the ones that got posted the latest just before the deadline. Right, so that they didn't have as long of a time for their peers to actually interact with it. On the flip side, I was a little bit worried that the first person to post in the forum would end up getting the most likes because they were the first person to post, um, but that didn't actually happen, uh, at least in the evaluation that I did, of course. Um, three out of the 12 weeks, the person who made the post earliest ended up getting the most likes, so it, that didn't really my concern there wasn't, um, didn't really play out. Uh, and Aubrey, at what point do you chime in on the discussion boards or do you let it be totally student driven? Oh, that's a great question, Aubrey. Um, actually to answer your question, Aubrey, I'm gonna jump ahead on my slides real fast. So this is, um, when I did the study on the, the power-ups, this, this graphic shows the interactions that were taking place from the instructor perspective. So these are just my interactions uh, in the Canvas course. So you'll notice the top one is announcements, the second one is the actual discussion posts, third is Canvas inbox messages, and the fourth is submission comments. So if you, if you look at that second to the top column, the discussion post, that's like the purplish color, kind of the darker color, um, you'll notice uh, the bigger the circle means the more interactions during that period. So right at the start, the very first like icebreaker discussion, I participated a ton. I got in there and I was modeling what I was wanting them to do in the discussion. And then I backed off and I, and I told my students, as far as expectations go, I wanted the forum to feel like their space to interact. Um, I wanted them to feel like they could um, post and interact with each other and that I wasn't interfering. We, we do know in the literature on online discussions that when, a, when an instructor comments, it can actually kill the discourse in the class because students have that perception that, you know, the, the authority has spoken on this and, and there's no more to discuss. And so part of that is to say that when you do engage, engage in, in thoughtful ways to to push that discourse forward. Um, and so you'll see that I only interacted, um, I would say sparingly throughout the rest of the semester, but I would point your attention to the two, the two items below, the Canvas inbox messages and the submission comments. For me, I felt like it was important to give my students feedback on a weekly basis on their discussion posts but I didn't want to do it in the threads themselves. So I actually gave comments to students in the submission comments. So using the speed grader feature, I would go in and give students individual feedback. And, and that's a great space too. Um, for example, if a student makes a post that may be kind of off topic or, or getting away from, from where uh, we're intending to uh, kind of drive the discourse or drive the discussion, the submission comments was a great space for me to reach out to them and say, hey, I really like what you're thinking here. Have you considered this? Uh, maybe consider adding something from this reading this week into your post. 
and, and, and helping to kind of coach them or to guide them in, uh, in that discussion. So I hope that answers your question, Aubrey. In, in general, I try to keep it student driven. Uh, Denise is asking, uh, have you used this with undergrads? It would take some pre-teaching to help gen ed students uh, understand or use Bloom's taxonomy verbs. Yeah, absolutely, Denise, that's a great point. Uh, this, class, this class in particular was with graduate students. Um, and I would advocate absolutely for, um, for kind of coaching or pre-teaching, helping the students to understand the purpose of what we're doing, why we're using these power-ups, why we're wanting to engage in different ways. Um, however, I will also point out that uh, Brad Gustafson, um, in his book, Renegade Leadership, is where I very first learned about the digital power-ups. And Brad, had, he's an elementary school principal, and one of his teachers in his building was using the digital power-up strategy with her elementary age students for them to engage in online discussions outside of class. And so I, I love that question, Denise, because yes, while I've used this with grad students, this was actually first introduced to be used with elementary students. Um, and so with some, with some teaching and with some, uh, you know, giving them the rationale for why we're doing this and, and why it's important, uh, I absolutely think undergrads uh, could be successful with this. And, and I know, uh, probably at least five or six other instructors that are using this strategy currently with undergrads uh, that I could point you to uh, in the app in the comments after. Okay, let's jump over real quick to an example. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll share my slides uh, on the resources page for my session. So you can go through and you can see all of the slides if you wanna go back and look at those. Um, but I, I really would love to get into some specific examples to show you. So one in particular, this is one that I used in one of my classes uh, where I wanted the students to uh, think about using the outdoors in the way that we, we teach our students and, and finding different spaces uh, to engage our students. Um, so I, I like to use this as an example because uh, I embedded a story from NPR so again, another plug for Canvas. I love being able to embed YouTube videos, embed content from other places directly into my thread to have students engage with. And then on each, each discussion each week, I would put the instructions. So for example, uh, use your two to three power-ups. Remember to use content from the texts that we're reading this week and comment at least on one other student's post, right? Kind of the standard expectations that that teaching process and, and flow of the class. And then I would also list all of the, the power-ups that were available to them that week. Um, so we have starting kind of in those lower level of blooms, we have the remember, understand, then we move into more of the application, apply, analyze, evaluate, and then create and connect kind of at the top. Um, and, I'll, and I'll share these with you too. Um, there was one question about how you activate the liking feature. So I wanna show that real quick. If you go into your discussion forum and you click edit at the top and you scroll down, I do threaded replies. I check that box. Um, and then there's this little box that says allow liking. So I'll check that and then sort by likes. I'll check that box. And so again, what that does is it, is it gives the students the option to like the post, um, to like each of the individual posts, and, and then it sorts by the most likes. So you'll see it down here at the bottom, there's just this little thumbs up. And uh, so this one had five likes. So these are just some samples, so you can kind of get a feel for what that looks like. I encourage the students to put the hashtag at the start of their post as a way to label in uh, which level, which power up they're using. Uh, the understand power up is to ask a question to their peers to help move that discourse forward. Um, and then, and it, at least in my implementation, I actually found students use the remember hashtag most often. And what came out in, and, 
And I will say at first I was kind of disappointed and I was like, ah, they're using the remember, like the lowest level one all the time. Uh, and I was a little bit disappointed about that. Uh, but in the qualitative comments from the students, what they were saying is they actually started using the hashtag remember as a way to tag things from class that they wanted to go back and remember later on. And so they actually started using it in a different way than I had actually intended. Uh, but I loved it. Like I, I love that they took it and, and started using it in a meaningful way. Uh, Sean's asking, so are power ups just keywords for the content of the chapter or are they words that we need them to use to raise to a higher, a higher learning? Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense, Sean. That's a good question. Um, so the power ups that I use here are just keywords from Bloom. So back from, uh, back from this, this slide, that list of Bloom's taxonomy verbs. Um, and I just used the same one that Brad Gustafson had used um, in his book to kind of try it out and see what worked. Um, other, other instructors who have implemented this have adapted, uh, created their own. And I was hoping that we would have time today to kind of dive into that ourselves, uh, but I, I might be running short on time already. <laughs> uh, yeah, but, we're at 10 after, Travis. Okay. Thank you, Shelley. So the, to answer your question, Sean, I use this specific list. So let me share this in the, let me share this in the, the chat real fast. So this is just a Google doc that has this has the examples of the digital power-ups uh, that I was just talking about. And what I was hoping for this, as, as I finish um, kind of showing you some of these examples and some of the resources available and answer any questions you have, I would love for you to try this out, right? So come down here to the bottom of the page and we have, remember the three elements that make up a digital power-up, the, the hashtag, the verb or the keyword. So Sean, it could be something from Bloom's. Um, it could be something that's a, that corresponds with content in your course. It could be anything that makes sense for your class and your content. And then a prompt that, that goes along with it. So I'd love for you to try this out. Create, create your own power up uh, down here at the bottom of the page. I, I put a new example that I, that I thought up um, a little while ago. You, know, you could use this idea of hashtag integrate. So that comes again from Bloom's taxonomy um, where we're taking two, two concepts, two different ideas, trying to combine them to help um, teach one of their peers about a, a new idea. Just, just an idea. I'm throwing out a digital power-ups that you can think about. Uh, another question in the chat, are you using digital power-ups for all of your discussions, discussion assignments weekly? Yes, so when I use the digital power up strategy, I'll use it on a weekly basis um, to go in there and, uh, and I do one week. So I set, that's a great question, Matt. So I do two things here. Um, I set my due date uh, for their post, their initial post by Wednesday of the week, of the, each week. So I will, I will have the discussion open from Monday through Friday each week. And I expect them to make their first initial post by Wednesday and they need to make their comments to their peers by Friday. And so that gives us a little bit of time for them on Monday and Tuesday to dive into the content that week, um, to start engaging and then to actually um, make a post by midweek and start in the discourse with their peers by the end of the week. That's kind of how I frame it with my students. Um, and I will say too, I didn't get to this in my slides, but I wanna jump back there real fast. Um, I wanted to share some of the actual voices, some of the comments from my students to give you an idea of uh, how, they were, how they were perceiving the use of this strategy. So Travis, we're at, we have five minutes left in the session, just in, in the event that other people might wanna hop in with some verbal questions. Okay, thank you, Shelley. Um, so this one, 
This one student said, power of to challenge me in ways I never thought possible while still allowing my creativity to thrive. Um, another student commenting about uh, instructor presence, about in the class, said, I appreciate the one-on-one -on -one feedback and quick answers to questions as I work through the discussions. So that's calling back to how I would respond to my students in the speed grader, and I would give them feedback during the week. Um, another student said they add focus and intent. Uh, another student said they allow me to make connections that are important to me and relevant to me, and they also help me to see different ways to consider topics. Another one said it, it's increasing my learning capacity. The final one um, that I wanted to share with you is um, a student that said, when, when I asked about you know, the, the discussions in this class in general at the end of the semester, uh, she said, I'm personally learning and growing by connecting with others. I feel that people's comments are more real in this class and I feel that our comments and contributions are authentic and that I have learned so much from the great things all of you are doing. And that just, to me, that really speaks to that social presence aspect. The students really felt ownership um, of the discussion forums throughout the course. And, and they did make meaningful connections with each other, uh, which allowed that discourse to really blossom and, and be meaningful throughout the semester. Uh, okay, I do have to share one more from the students. Um, my, one of my students used hashtag create and she created this uh, acoustic creation to talk about um, if she were to summarize digital power ups, she would use the word empower empower my students. And she did that by starting each, each line of uh, each sentence with a word or a letter from empower. She said, each opinion is important, create ways for all voices to be heard. Motivation is key to learning. Games, competition and debate create motivation. Uh, participation that is meaningful is much better than participation that is required. Online doesn't mean impersonal. Make online encounters engaging. What works for one class or students may not work for all. Keep trying new things. Emphasize the process, not the product, and relinquish some control to the learner is good teaching. I thought that was so, uh, so pertinent and perfect for uh, this, this strategy and the idea of engaging our learners um, in, in new ways to give them both choice and voice. Uh, so before we have to go, I wanted to give you one, one final resource if you go to Commons, um, down at the left-hand side, kind of towards the bottom in your Canvas course, and you click on that Commons tab, this opens up a space where you can uh, look at other content that's been created by uh, hundreds and thousands of others. There's so many things in here, whether it's discussions or a full course or an assignment. This is really helpful, especially if you're creating a, a new online course or a, a blended course to get some content. Uh, but specifically, if you type in, uh, actually don't type my last name because there's lots of other Thurston's, type uh, power ups. And you'll see this link to digital power up discussion example. And this is one of the examples that I used in my own course. And if you click on the import or download button there, you can actually import that directly into your own course. And so you'll have that discussion and you can, and then you can adapt it from there. You can kind of play with it from there. Um, so in final word here, um, I'm gonna post these resources um, along with a few other things that I've learned about digital power-ups along the way uh, in, uh, I'll put it in the session on our website in the resources. And then I'll also post it on Mighty Networks in the conference app so you have access to those. Do we have time for like one question? So you can see that uh, that uh, Mamet has a has a question there in the chat about have you checked on students who get low low responses? Does it cause them to be anxious or depressed if they don't seem to get responses? Oh yeah, that's a good question, Mamet. Um, in in the evaluation I did, I did find that the students who uh, didn't uh, earn as many likes were students uh, who were, it was harder for them to engage in general, right? Um, several of them had things going on in, in their personal lives that prevented them from being uh, super active in the discussion threads. 
And so that did come out in the comments that they felt like they couldn't contribute as much as they liked, would have liked to, um, to the class discussion. Um, so that's, that's certainly something that we need to be aware of. Um, and that's so why I appreciate you calling that out. Um, and for me, the way I would, uh, the way that I address that in my own class was to use the Canvas inbox messages. So I was sending out messages to students, hey, I noticed you, you didn't post this week, or I, I noticed you forgot to comment, or you know, is, is there something I can do to help? And, and reaching out to them that way uh, to make sure that we're, we're still connecting and still, um, still fostering those, those personal connections. Great. Travis, thank you so much. And thanks everyone for attending this session. Um, remember that the, the app, the Mighty Networks app is available to continue to have some networking with Travis and to put some, your ideas and your, and your responses there as well. And then we've got our final session that will be um, starting in a few minutes. So if you wanna go back to the main page and then connect there, I think by now you've all got it figured out. Travis, it was, it was wonderful. This isn't the first time I've heard you talk about this, and there's so many great ideas to, to incorporate to help our students engage with each other, especially now that they're engaging virtually. And so um, thank you so much, and, and thanks to everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much.